welcome everyone. We are uh, excited that uh, after a long time of trying, we we have today with us um, uh, Eva Steuerberg, uh, Professor of Clinical Biostatistics and Medical Decision Making at Leiden University Medical Center and the Erasmus Medical Center. He has been chairing the Department of Biomedical Data Sciences since 2017. Yeah. And uh, his methodological research concentrates on the role of prediction models and randomized clinical trials for better decision making make in uh, individual patients. And uh, yeah, without further ado, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to be able to uh, um, participate in this series of uh, seminars that you have. Um, I was looking at the uh, the beautiful place of Basel, but only in the virtual background that you present. So, um, yeah, so I will talk and, and I hope uh, just to uh, give you some, some perspectives, uh, reflections on uh, from an open science uh, perspective on, on data for prediction and some um, experiences I have in that field. And I also invite you to uh, interrupt or ask a question maybe in the chat or so, I don't know. How we can let this work out but uh, that i'm not talking all the time and you can just interrupt so uh open data for better prediction is the, is the basic uh, idea so so if we think about open science i i've struggled with that for some time and i have also been invited to talk about that in at, at some other occasions so it's a bit of search and well open is in contrast to closed science. So how was that? Well, long ago, the scientific field was dominated by a few elitarian scientists, and they did their private experiments, small scale, and they had discussions in small closed communities. Well, and great things came from that. So I have some pictures here. So this is uh, Huygens here to the uh, upper right, the van der Rekening in Spelen van Geluk, huh, on probability theory. Uh, he did uh, really, really very um, important work there to define a probability. And there's Thomas Bayes uh, at, at the bottom uh, on this Bayes theorem. And here we have Laplace. Uh, we also uh, still go back to that in statistics. Uh, we wrote really famous books, but they were relatively small, uh, small initiatives that were working on their own, right? Um, more recently, there is more science as a profession. You can say, I become a scientist and you get employed, you get a salary. Um, and with that comes larger scale issues on the protection of data that you have access to, especially in uh, epidemiology, I see that. And also the code, sometimes people see that as intellectual property. Um, and then the, the ambition is really to uh, have some shocking findings, some surprises, something new, where you and you publish that in a high impact factor journal. That is the downside of this, this scale. And to give you one example, and this is uh, from the COVID time, I will, I will take some examples from COVID. Who's to blame? Uh, three scientists at the Surgery Sphere COVID-19 scandal. Surgery Sphere was an initiative of data sharing uh, from different registries to learn about COVID. So I did some a few more slides on that. Uh, here they say author partnership on the coronavirus papers is completely bizarre and should have been a red flag. So what's the case? There were some famous professors here. You see the Lancet publication that was then retracted on this hydro hydroxychloroquine uh, treatment. Um, a multinational registry analysis. And that they were authors on, on that with, with some co-authors with it, but always the three of them. Um, yeah, and it turned out that the data were not, not just not there. It was, was just, uh, it was completely misleading. So this is what is on the science uh, website. Uh, as you can go there and check uh, how they reflect on it. So they say there are three unlikely collaborators at the heart of this fast moving uh, scandal. Uh, retractions in the Lancet, it just showed that, but also in New England, they had a paper and other uh, withdrawal. These three physician scientists never were in the same institute, nor had they ever met before writing together. They were the only authors in common for these disputed papers. And this partnership, 
uh, high impact uh, has now ended uh, because the data uh, apparently was a, was a fraud. So um, what I was struck by was this issue of that these physician scientists never were at the same institute, never uh, physically met. Uh, where, and and that, that would be actually in the spirit of, of open science that you just collaborate across the globe with, with experts in different fields and, and you don't necessarily have to sit down. It's, it's very different from the old school collaboration. So that brings me to a first uh, challenge for you or question. There's no true or false. Um, yeah, thanks. So, so open science will research will make research better as a claim. I think many people, yeah, in the, at least those who are working in open science would say yes, but maybe not all of you, so you can vote. Um, okay, so um, nobody disagrees. Yeah, so, so we there, apparently we all believe in the kind of progress, right? That that currently things are uh, neutral or better than uh, the old ages. Um, yeah, agree. So the pros are obvious. So, so, so maybe someone can you can um, unmute, right? And just say what's the first thing you would think of as as a pro? Well, what 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 are the good things of open science? Is that allowed to uh, Xeni? That people can use their microphone? Yeah, yeah. Everyone can or write in the chat. Or write in the chat, yeah, but just, just whatever you feel comfortable with. If you can then benefit from the work of others and use it for your own work, okay. yes. and there's more collaboration. You can benefit from the work from others and, and also this collaboration. And then, yeah, yeah, nice. And other, other suggestions, immediate thoughts. Oh, well, uh, I will say the ability to learn by just reproducing what has been done already. Learning by reproducing what has been done. Yeah. So then you need access to, to, to what yeah. was done, eh? not only in the classical writing in a manuscript. Yeah, also. yeah. yeah nice. This can also give uh, like uh, um, also foster maybe new ideas. If you have, uh, you start from uh, something by reproducing what some people have done, and then you build on that, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, so the better access to what was done before helps you in making your next step in the ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I would say the overall progress in science is faster if one uses open science. Overall progress is faster. Yeah, that 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 that's that's a claim again, a hope, right? Then, uh, and how would that that progress materialize? What would you think of? Well, if people share access, then potentially more people are working on the problems, and and if they share, uh, there will be more synergies, and and yeah, I guess progress uh, is, is faster. So yeah, yeah. No, so I, the, the many things that I hear that they resonate with what I, in principle, agree with. Huh? That, that, I mean, there's a lot of hassle and practicalities and discussion to get access to just replicate what others did. And that, that can be, and it, in principle, I also agree with the last comment that, that yes, if, if more people work on something it, and, they, and they have some knowledge, of course, you assume that they are knowledgeable people, that, then uh, that's better than, than a single group. And I have actually an example I will share with you of such a, uh, an attempt to let have multiple, multiple groups work on a problem. Any final thoughts? Something. Overall, we are optimistic or neutral, right? I, I, I myself, I typed in neutral. I thought, yeah, there are pros and cons, but overall, I think maybe you should say, uh, I, I try to pop and make it a bit strong, like the advantages are obvious. But, um, there, in, in this example of, of data sharing, that there was just it, it, there was fraud going on, which is always a difficult topic and can anyway happen also in, also in the old uh, days in the classical uh, scientific tradition. Um, but the question might be whether that is more readily happening with, with, with this open structure. I leave that for discussion. Maybe I, I'll just move on now and we'll come back to uh, this and other issues uh, later. So let me, um, so there was this voting, thanks. And today, so what I, I'll, 
try to focus on is the strong points in open science um, and the challenges. And that is from my, my personal experience, as, as was mentioned in the beginning, my, my focus has been on prediction research and predict outcome for patients who are in the hospital, whether they did die or, or survive complications, so that, that kind of thing. So um, in, the topic is really open science to better address the big research questions and give you one example in line with what we were just talking about. Uh, one data set, many analysts. So that, 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 what, what, do, what happens then? Um, so and this was published some years ago. It was a sensitive topic, whether dark skin soccer players would get a red card more often than uh, white skin soccer players. So whether that there's kind of discrimination going on. Um, well, there's a big team then. This was kind of a competition, uh, how it was set up. Uh, I take a key uh, key picture from that. Um, oh, sorry, some descriptions first, sorry. 29 teams uh, with 61 analysts. Uh, scientists, they had the same data set, they had the same research question, uh, whether soccer referees are more likely to give a red card to a dark skin, dark skin tone player than light skin tone player. Um, and the estimated odds ratio or relative risk estimates was really uh, very wide, uh, wild, I would say, yeah, between point Eight nine and two point nine three with a median of one point three. So the median was was above one. So there was more likelihood of giving a red card to a dark skin tone player than uh, than a white uh, player, light skin tone player. So above one was the median effect. Um, Twenty teams had a statistically significant. Uh, so bring that up again, statistically significant positive effect, and for nine it was non significant. So I'll uh, show you the key picture. Um, that is this, so there are these 29 teams here. Uh, they have different analytical approaches, which are all characterized with, with some keywords here. And here are these odds ratios. So 0.89 are the relative effect estimates, below one, and then they go up to, up to 2.9. Well, extremely uncertain according to the analysis, but they came up with a very high relative risk estimate in a fossil regression. So what I find interesting is that um, the terminology is sometimes similar. Like here they say, yeah, I did a fossil regression, but the est estimate was 0.89. And here they say, yeah, also fossil regression, uh, but it's 1.3. And the, also the extreme one, fossil 2.9. So this broad label is not sufficient. Right. It, it, it is, this warns us that, that the devil is in the details. It's really how you did these analyses. Um, logistic regression was very popular, which, which directly results, I guess, in a loss ratio. Well, for some, give you a rate ratio, technically speaking. But uh, logistic is everywhere, but the estimates are, are very different 1.5, and here it's 1.03, 1.2. So, yeah, very different details behind it. So their conclusion and, um, was, yes, that, the, that, that these differences are, are really uh, very large. And that is especially by the unique combinations of the covariates, what to adjust for an analysis. So how you do the technicalities in the analysis. The variation in analysis of complex data may be difficult to avoid. And even by experts with honest intentions. And so it's really because this was this competition and this warns us on, on this extra variability so it makes it visible so i think yes overall this is a strong point of a kind of open data competition open science effort and that we realize that this happens and the, the experts and i assume they were experts there was of course some debate about that but they have honest intentions and they come up with very different answers um so now let's move to multiple data sets and kind of methods comparisons. There's also a lot of work in that and specifically in this field of AI and machine learning. And that is a, a very, um, very busy field, a lot going on there, very popular. Um, so I'll take an example for my colleague, Maite van Smede, that he often shows. 
machine learning models in electronic health records. And the claim is they can outperform conventional models, regression-based or survival models, to predict patient mortality. So machine learning is better. That's the title, outperform. Well, it says can outperform, so it's already a bit more neutral, but uh, in general, it's, it's, it's positive on that. Well, that was taken up in the, in the news. So they apparently had a, uh, a message sent out that uh, AI beats doctors. Okay, that sounds very really strong and it, it's repeated in different outlets. Um, now look at the, the findings. Are they really convincing? I will not go into detail, but they did a Cox regression. That's classic, uh, a random forest, uh, elastic net. Um, I would still consider all of these in a kind of uh, yeah, modern statistical analysis direction. Uh, elastic net has, has penalty terms in it, uh, random forest. Yeah, maybe that is AI machine learning type of thing. But if you look at the performance that it, it 0 0.79, 0 0.79, 0 0.80, this is all relatively close together, right? So all, all, if you round it around 0.8, and it depends on, on how you do the specifics again, whether you consider 30 predictors or, or 600, but in these most complex models here, random forest with 600 or elastic net, yeah, this is all, all close together, I would say. Traditional crocs per personal hazards, even with 30, does quite a good job. So um, that's actually also uh, their conclusion. The authors write, we found that Random Forest did not outperform Cox models. Okay, and elastic nets, okay, they achieved the highest discrimination and uh, regularization. So they pointed the technicality, the penalty terms to select relevant, relevant variables and optimize model coefficients. So the authors themselves were actually modest in their conclusions, while the media, they exaggerated a bit, like AI beats doctors. It's also a question, where are the doctors here? There are no doctors. It's all statistical learning, right? So the findings were not convincing here. And uh, yeah, whether that, that is then the next question, is that a systematic thing that it's all more or less the same? Uh, or it depends. That's really what fascinates me. And maybe we can learn from open science, open data initiatives on this it depends issue. Well, this perspective on, on learning on when and how methods uh, are optimal or, or beneficial uh, was also argued by, by uh, Anna-Laura Bolusti, I, I should pronounce it the right way. I don't know exactly. I, I thought she was also in Munich. Uh, she's in München, and that's where, where Esme uh, um, is actually, I think, uh, not in Basel, but at least, uh, yeah. And, and then she wrote on, on this necessity for neutral comparison studies. That's what she argued for, that, that uh, they should not have the aim to demonstrate the superiority of a particular method. So neutral is, is in contrast to the typical method comparison study that you see in the message journals where typically someone proposes a new method and then says, yeah, in this, in this simulation study, it does better than a comparator. And there's obviously uh, something at stake because you, you propose something new, which is designed to work for a, a, a specific context. So um, one example that uh, Anna Laude worked on herself was in this um, um, Example with 243 real data sets, nice number, in the open machine learning database. So she could identify these data sets there, did a random forest compared to logistic regression, and it appeared there that across these 243, random forest performed better. And it was 0.04 in, the, in a performance measure on the area under the ROC curve that's commonly used as a measure of discriminative ability. So slightly better better performing 0.04 um, with the modern method. But the results were dependent on the inclusion and the, uh, which data set you looked at. So specifically in the medical data set, there was not that much advantage. And there was a technicality that it relied on a cross-validation procedure. But in general, I, I like these kind of comparisons that there is such a thing as this open ML database where you can address, where you can uh, do these kind of uh, comparative studies. So it still leaves open this, this clarification question on when it works best. Um, but what, what I 
would expect, uh, based on also some other research, is really, yes, at least you need really large numbers. And that is what we had in a paper here, that the modern, modern modeling techniques are data hungry. We use that term and we like that data hungry. They need really large numbers, simulation study for predicting dichotomous endpoints, uh, where we compared machine learning techniques to, uh, to more classical approaches. There's also another uh, really a systematic review on uh, medical data, medical context, machine learning versus classical modeling. Systematic review shows no performance benefit. So here we have the title, which uh, as the main finding, there was no clear performance benefit of machine learning over logistic regression. And the key uh, figure is this. So the difference in discrimination, again, this uh, performance measure area under the ROC curve, the C statistic, and uh, neutral is, is a zero difference. And overall, there seems to be any machine learning seems to be a positive effect. Right? And this is on the difference on the logit 0.25, so in a positive direction. However, if we split by low risk of bias, so a really fair test of model performance, then there was actually no difference. It was really close to zero. Only if there was what we call the high risk of bias, so that's of course up to debate, but things like that you tune the optimization in the validation set, that sort of thing's going on, then that is not fair, uh, we said. So you need a low risk of bias assessment, and then there was actually uh, not, that, not much difference. So in the medical data sets that we looked at, um, it seems to be that that uh, was not that uh, that obvious. So this is the cartoon uh, that fits with the statistics, a bit boring. Well, maybe do it around this crack. We make a, an, uh, we frame it, we call it machine learning, but even better, we call it artificial intelligence. It's still, it's still a bit of a hype, but uh, yeah, then it, and maybe open science, open data can, uh, can help us to, to learn more about this, um, this field. Where is the benefit? Especially in image analysis, I see a lot of benefit. But in the classical medical prediction, where I work, uh, the, the benefit is rather limited. So what I uh, showed this far, this is one data set in multiple modelers for the red card problem and the neutral comparison by Anlaude Buchai. Uh, and also this is review. Um, so it's all kind of yeah working in the open, uh, open science direction. Another direction is uh, the data sharing, that we have access to more data than in the classical setting. And there's a tension, I, I think, between, say, collaboration uh, versus just giving things um, away for, for open access. Um, so one example is, is very old. This is my, one of my first papers in 95 where I worked on a prediction of, of a mass histology. So where a, a tumor mass was treated well, so it was benign after treatment, after chemotherapy uh, for metastatic disease. And I did some analyses based on data from six study groups. So that was a kind of individual patient da data meta-analysis. Um, and that uh, yeah, it was a joint effort when all the authors are from these different groups, uh, et cetera, that kind of uh, collaborative effort. Um, the six study groups I want to emphasize because I was in retrospect, I think, uh, yeah, I, I had this table one where I showed six study groups uh, with the principal investigator and some references and where they were from and the numbers of patients that they contributed. But, but after this step, after table one, I just pulled everything, merged, lumped, aggregated everything together. Um, and I did a logistic model, but ignoring the between center differences. So in retrospect, I think that was not the most sensible thing. Uh, you need to take the clustering into account when you go on with the analysis in general. So why was this attractive still, even with the methodological limitation of ignoring these, these differences. Well, I think the basic idea is just having more data is better, right? And to illustrate that further, I am, we have just to start, we are starting on a new project on a 4D picture, EU sponsored project and a central table there is yes, we will have access to really large data sets, large registries, melanoma, breast cancer, prostate from different countries, et cetera, large numbers and to impress the reader that, that's where we go for here. 
So the claim is more data is better. And thank you, Xeni. So I had to pull, pull, uh, pull for that. So is that obvious? Or is it, oh, usually if you have more data, it's more garbage in, more garbage out. Or it depends, that may be the safe option, but... Um, okay, so we have a nice distribution. It depends is the favorable answer. Um, yeah, so what does it depend on? Huh? And there are some obvious advantages. So, so maybe we'll start with someone who said agree, obvious. Any comment on why, what, what was the, the first thing to think of? More data is better. Anyone? So I did agree. So I also think it always depends, but I think like the results will be more reliable if you have more uh -huh. data. And reliable in what sense? So there, if there is more data available, you have a broader, uh, like you have a broader amount of data, and there's more different kind of people there, or like it, it gives a better overall uh, image. I think. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So, so, so you say reliable, but also broader, etc. So it's not purely yeah. statistical because that would be kind of the the obvious thing if you have larger numbers your standard error goes down that sort of thing mm -hmm. yeah but also there's just a lot more components and more yeah yeah so it's so also the the representativeness the, the, the yeah different okay. that was the word i was looking yeah. for <laughs> any any other thoughts comments yes i also said that answer and i agree with the other uh, speaker yeah, as so the confidence intervals are smaller. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's kind of the obvious thing. I, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there's also at least someone, if you have seven, that's one <laughs> disagreeing. That would be me. Uh -huh. uh, well, I am more in the life sciences, so we, uh, quality of data matters. So I have to say if it's, for instance, uh, data about gene sequencing if the sequencing itself the quality of it is bad it doesn't matter there's a lot of it it's garbage yes 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 yeah so so you were thinking about the life sciences yes yeah, yeah, yeah. in that yeah and okay so maybe some people that is it depends then you can say yeah some pro and some con or so and uh, you know, we probably we all agree that that obviously it depends that that it's of course obviously that there needs to be some kind of minimum data quality if you are going to combine uh, data from different sources so that that's my my main point i think the data quality and then do checks for that and that is sometimes difficult that, that was why i showed this first example of the surgery sphere this covid example where they work with data which apparently looked fine if you did the analysis but underlying, uh, it was just garbage. Yeah. I'll expand a bit on this. And then if people want to join in, uh, hopefully at the end, uh, I think I need something like 10, 15 minutes to finish the talk and then uh, we can discuss further. So, so the more data is better uh, vote. Well, yeah, so the larger sample size uh, is, is uh, so the example I gave was for a relatively rare disease, testicular cancer. So that's why it was really beneficial to have these six study groups. And I want to spend some time on the disadvantages, the risks, the, the heterogeneity in, uh, that you may then, that enters your analysis. Um, and also, yeah, we have to realize that, that data sharing and this intent of uh, bringing together data often involves quite some politics. You need to talk to people, um, you need maybe even visit them and make a joint research program. That, that, that works best in my experience. Uh, open science op would go one step further and just say, you need to make your data available to anyone who wants to, to work with it. Um, but that's, that's for discussion. Eh? Does that then also make for better science immediately? Um, okay, so let me first start with, with some issues in analysis and interpretation. So what is a very uh, nice example, I think, of the um, open science community and, and collaborative efforts is this Odyssey uh, initiative, Observational Health Data Science and Informatics. 
And this is a newsletter they have, and they advertise there the, a map with all the sites that participate in, in contributing uh, data to this network. So what they did per site is have a standardization of their, their data infrastructure. Uh, well, they want to have a meaningful, meaningful, provide meaningful evidence to impact both health and healthcare. Well, that, that sounds very good, and right? you cannot object to that. That ambition is really, really good. Um, well, so, so what, what they say a bit about uh, that they have a global community, I uh, highlight some words here, COVID-19 was, was, was something they focused on, uh, and they think this is a shining example, and they post things, this is also typical, I think, for open science, uh, that we put more on these archive servers, I see that now routinely being done, and that, that fits with what we briefly, what some people, some people said in the beginning, that um, uh, having access to uh, results, and this is then earlier access, is a good, is a good thing. Uh, well, they again mentioned their COVID studies and their um, data partners uh, well, to, to work on, this, on, on COVID issues. So they also have a paper on the, in the prediction direction that, that I'm focused on. Um, this describes design and implementation of a framework to generate uh, patient level prediction models. So uh, they focus not on the, so the average, but really try to uh, be on the patient level. And what they uh, need for that is this OMOP common data model. So uh, there are here in this network data sets which remain local and heterogeneous data structure in the raw data. But now with this OMOP model, you come to a uh, common data model, one to, to N, and you can extract from that uh, the data that you need for your analysis. And you can make this extraction with uh, uh, target populations or for their outcome, for the time at risk, and they have all kinds of procedures to do that uh, consistently uh, for these different data sources. And then you can do things like, okay, I train the data here and I test in the others. Uh, you can also cross-validate, et cetera. So they have all idea on how to do this uh, this modeling then and the same code is applied to each data set so that is, that that is as such a very efficient idea indeed so one example and how this worked out so this is again discrimination so the c statistic area and the roc curve um here is something um for different outcomes so glaucoma and uh, or i think this is the yeah outcome is shown here, yeah, uh, and gastrointestinal hemorrhage, but can we predict that, acute MI, stroke, so very different outcome, but they were all, all quite predictable, it seems here, uh, with a machine learning algorithm running in these different data sets. Um, but here you see some other problems like uh, insomnia, diarrhea, and nausea, that they're more difficult to predict. So that kind of lessons, this is well predictable, this is poorly predictable, and that, that, that is a nice message, I think. If you go to other data sets, so this is one data set and these are two others, then everything is systematically worse. And here it's 0.7 approximately. So, so there are differences between these data sets. This was maybe a really high quality data set or really informative characteristics of patients, while this was more difficult here. A calibration issue they also look at so that that as such is, is a good thing again uh, to look for whether if you predict 10 percent risk is it also observed to be 10 percent on average so the whole all the idea I, I support that warmly that i think it's really bridging this data sharing to analysis in one framework you keep the data local and you run run this locally started analysis and you first do some usually on, on one data set but then you can really have it um, been done centrally on all these available uh, data sets. Um, and you share the results. So this is really an example of, of data sharing, of collaboration in the, in the modern world. So that's on the analysis part, now on the interpretation. There, there are these, these uh, challenges as they also recognize themselves in the Odyssey network, that there's heterogeneity, differences between these settings. And I, if I focus on prediction research, I, I came up with this, this set of 
characteristics, there may be more. So the study design may be really different, uh, whether it was a, a registry, registry um, or a trial or some observational study that, that, that you look at. The selection of patients may be really different. That's the second point. The measurement may differ. That is, some people dive into that uh, uh, measurement error, how that impacts on predictability, etc. Uh, the outcomes need to be defined in the same way. That is often a challenge. And one example is for the for the framing and models. Framing um, was this, this small village where all the cardiovascular risk models have been derived from. And uh, if you look at the outcome that they consider, it's always slightly different. Cardiovascular disease is defined in slightly different ways. And if you look at validation studies, again, there's variability in the outcome definition. So that is an, an issue. The associations of the covariates, the characteristics of the patient with the outcome, they may be different. So true differences um, that, that age effect is different in one setting and another or, or other covariates. The overall outcome rate is different and it's especially affected by, by the context that we do the prediction. There are many factors that we have no explicit measurement for, or we do not include them in our models. And so outcome uh, typically varies and is unexplained by, by the covariates. And then also the performance, so this discriminative ability, uh, that was clear in the previous example also, the performance differs. So heterogeneity is really broad, it's, it's, it's common if you, are going this direction of data sharing and combining data from different sources. So we did some work on that, on how to assess heterogeneity in individual patient data, meta-analysis of participants, we call it here, IPD meta-analysis. Uh, and we, we illustrate that with some ideas that we had uh, on how to look at that. So we had an example with 15 studies here with different time periods, different types of studies. So that is this first point on the, that the study design may be different. RCTs, randomized control trial, first observational data analysis, so that's a survey. And so four surveys and the rest were trials, in total something like 9,000 patients. Well, there was heterogeneity in case mix. We illustrate that here with the 15 studies are on the x-axis. And then here, this looks at age. So you see the median age quite different between these studies. Uh, some important prognostic factor and characteristic that relates to the outcome, the motor score, quite different distribution. Pupils, whether both react or one or, or none, quite different. And then here is study five, uh, many with, with, with no, no responsive pupils, etc. So there were really in the baseline characteristics already quite some differences. Then look at, say, the predictor effects is the association of these characteristics with the outcome different. So, for example, here is age, and we standardize that in some, some way, but the effect is a bit small here, and very large here, um, very different between studies. Motor score, well, a bit more consistent, one might think. Pupillary reactivity, again, quite some variability. Hypoxia looks okay. There's one study here, it's a smaller hypotension effect, etc. So there's differences in the prognostic effects, especially where you have this age, maybe. Eventually, if you make predictions and you want to know, okay, does it matter which data set I take to do that, to, to make these predictions? And that's what we try to do here. We call this a one-to-one uh, -one plot. So here on the diagonal, there are the 15 studies and we compare the predictions from study one with the other studies and then study two with the other studies. So the first one here looks really very good. And I have an enlargement of that. So study one and study two, here they are very close to this 45 degree line. So they make really very similar predictions, but there is a systematic difference. And, and I was preparing with Esme that we thought, yeah, so study two is a American uh, variant, uh, the American counterpart of the international studies. These are, I know that what these studies are. They are both uh, studying one particular drug, international study and the US study. And in the US, the mortality was a little bit lower. So study two, you predict a little bit lower here. So for example, 40% predicted by study one in the international context, but around say 30, 35% 
in the US context. So there's this systematic deviation here. But there are other studies like study two, study three, where you see these, these typical patterns that some covariate effects are really different. And well, if you look at the, the, here, there are some that really don't correspond at all. And so one study would give you a very low prediction, while the other study would give you a very high prediction. So this gives some insight in heterogeneity at the individual level, at the individual predictions. And we did these calculations for all the covariate patterns that were in the data set. Um, so there, there, there are more low risk predictions than high risk overall, but uh, you can see the differences and uh, yeah, it is one way to appreciate this heterogeneity. So um, eventually, yeah, what does it, what's the uncertainty then in an individual, for an individual? Um, and, and we did this now overall. So if you ignore heterogeneity, you will say, okay, so based on age, young to old age prediction would be low risk of death as in young people usually survive a trauma. This is on the trauma database. And while older people have a higher risk and the uncertainty around that would be, be relatively small. But now if you include a random intercept, so you add a, a um, random effect in your model for the intercept, for the baseline risk, then you see that this interval, the, the confidence interval, the prediction interval, I should say, is really increasing substantially already. If you do some, some other trick um, um, with allowing effects to, to vary overall, then, uh, well, again, a little bit more, but fully stratified. So just uh, leave everything free per study and then combine in a multivariate meta-analysis kind of approach. Yeah, we see that the uncertainty, if you're 70 years old, yeah, it can be between, say, 15 and 60%. So we are and approaching the point that you're saying, well, because of this heterogeneity, the only thing we can say, yeah, your probability is between zero and one, and that, that's non-informative, of course. But the general point is uncertainty is much larger if you really consider the between center, the between study differences than if you ignore that. Ignoring would be uh, yeah, a bit stupid. So um, this brings me to my, my concluding slide, and then I welcome any, any comments, uh, discussion, whatever comes up. So in general, yes, open science is better science. Uh, so one example was this, this research questions that you can address in, in, in a broader community and competitions, the red card example in the neutral comparison studies, meta research type of work. Uh, the second issue I tried to um, talk about a bit was on this data sharing. And in my experience, collaborative efforts have been most successful. So you do collaborate with, with the original researchers and try to go uh, further than they went by combining data, by addressing new questions. And third is this analysis issue. And the Odyssey framework is, is modern. It has this uh, federated learning idea. We keep the data local, um, but we need to be aware of issues in heterogeneity, differences between settings that we should not ignore. So this is what I wanted to uh, share with you and um, yeah, happy to um, discuss further.